to play in um, Macon, Georgia, which is where the record label Capricorn Records lives. And sure enough, you know, a month or two later, there we were playing this club in Macon, Georgia. Uh, the Allman Brothers were not on the road, so there was Chuck. He came <laughs> sat in with us. We did cool. Jessica. And at the end of the night, we met the president of the label, Phil Walden, and his vice presidents and everybody else from the label who Chuck Lavelle and Twigs Linden were raving about. And so that's a, a case of being at the right place at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the music business works. And so we get our first record deal and what the first record deal did was not change our lives all that much. It's not like, hey, we got a record deal, we're rich and famous. It just expands um, your horizons in terms of getting out of just playing one region of the country. Right. So now we were playing all over the United States and then beginning to get little teeny bits of airplay again because nobody could categorize the Dixie Dregs. We thought our calling card is the fact that you can't categorize us, <laughs> but in an industry that feels it has to categorize you to be able to market you right it can make it very difficult yeah challenging right yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you guys were nominated at least several times for grammy awards i am a proud six-time grammy loser i mean it's awesome nominated six times i think our band might have created um the best rock instrumental category because you know other than jeff beck maybe uh, we were the only band where the entire album uh, was instrumental. And so to fill out the category with other bands, um, typically most of the other records um, were of bands or artists that had vocal songs, except for one instrumental song, like one year we were beaten by a band called A Flock of Seagulls. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, because they had one instrumental on the record and their record was a big album seller. You know, it might have been a platinum album that year. Right. Paul McCartney beat us one year because on one of his records, he invited all his friends to do a one note jam. But so, you know, a couple of the years we didn't feel badly because I think maybe Jeff Beck won one year. Yeah. Maybe Frank Zappa won it one year because he did an instrumental. And you know, these are incredibly talented musicians. But yes, it was always an honor to uh, to find ourselves being nominated in that category. And it was six straight albums. With the dregs, I know, what were your highlights? Uh, one of the greatest moments and uh, of my career, and it happened with the Dixie Dregs. It might've even been <clears throat> our first time playing in California. I think it was for the second album, What If, we did three nights in the Roxy Theater in LA on Sunset Strip, on the Sunset Strip, opening up for the Billy Cobham band. And, you know, Billy Cobham was one of my idols. And so here I was, um, the opening drummer for Billy Cobham. Um, so the way the gig happens at the Roxy is, there's a curtain and the Roxy holds about 500 people. There's a curtain, the shows were sold out. You get situated with your instrument. I'm sitting on the drums, the curtain's down. You hear them announce, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Dixie Dregs. We start playing, the curtain goes up. <clears throat> the way the club is set up is there are little tables and chairs and the stage is not that high so that the first row of people at their tables, like their arms, are literally resting on the stage. We're playing, the curtain goes up, and I know every one of the five of us in the band is looking across the front row at Stanley Clark, Jaco Pistorius, Lenny White, um, Michael Walden, John McLaughlin, 
it was so insane, right? The no. two the most famous bass players, living bass players at the time, John McLaughlin, the granddaddy of it all, there they were watching us. Like these are the guys who we spent the last few years buying every record that they made and devouring every single, you know, lick on these records. Suddenly we're playing for them because they came to see their friend Billy Cobham and the other people in his band. Right. So what what about happened with him intim intimidation? <laughs> it, was, it was terrifying. Uh, terrifying but exhilarating. Yeah. Both at the same time. And you know, after we played, we got to meet all of these people and they were all, you know, just saying the nicest things to us. And so I think for for the five of us in the band, it almost felt like a rite of passage, almost being welcomed yeah. into whatever the club is or you did it you did it we did something. it okay so <laughs> at the end of that set billy came out for an encore and there on stage with his band were the guys i just mentioned so i'm you know this is like a who's who of <laughs> jazz fusion um but so there on stage was billy sitting on his drums and so there I was in the audience, flipping out, watching this, watching history being made. And I think it was Lenny White was like hitting the tambourine so hard, it split in half. And half of it flew in the air off the stage and I grabbed it. <laughs> I, it's one of my most prized possessions. <laughs> I, have it, I have it to this day. So that, that was really a life changing moment for me. And one of, one of you know, the greatest memories that I keep. So, so you know, with each record, uh, the Dixie Dregs sold more. I think we got to the point where, you know, our records were selling upwards of maybe 100,000 units, which for this kind of music, it's, uh, I guess, commendable. So the band was together as a full-time band until 1983. Uh, then we parted ways until further notice. It was just time. Last tour at the Dregs in 2018, right? And then, yeah, the you know, reunion tour we did about, I think it was 36 shows across the country. It was very successful, and it was so wonderful to be back together as a unit with the original five guys from yeah. the first album that came out in 1977. That's really cool. It was fantastic, and that's not a farewell tour either. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that we'll ever play again. Um, and for the time being, I have a feeling we we might not ever play again. Yeah. But, but I'm glad it came off with a bang. And Steve Morse asked me if I would continue playing with him in the Steve Morse band. So I did that with him uh, for a couple of albums. And then in 1986, Steve was asked to join the group Kansas, who were reforming. And uh, I wished him well. I mean, it was a great opportunity for him. And that's when I moved from Atlanta, Georgia, back to New York. I had to look for the next thing to do. I didn't go to New York wanting to go. I went out of necessity because I was now an unemployed, I mean, essentially an unemployed musician. So how were you, were you nervous? Were you, how were you? I was very nervous and I was not in a great frame of mind, but I had a name at this point. I had um, been on the cover of Modern Drummer once and so I, you know, I had enough of, uh, of a name recognition to where I was able to get into a handful of auditions. Looking for anything specific? No, I was looking to work. Just period. <laughs> to find the next thing. Oh yeah, anything, sure. And um, I basically, you know, failed about five auditions. I auditioned for George Michael, Billy Idol, uh, Joe Lynn Turner, uh, Patti Smythe and Scandal. And I, always, I love telling this one funny story. In the case of Joe Lynn Turner, you know, who Joe has had a great career and he has sang in, uh, was he in Deep Purple? Yeah, he was in well, Rainbow, Deep Purple. And Rainbow, and Rainbow, right, right. So I was recommended to him through a manager who had actually been managing the Steve Morse band, a man by the name of Larry Mazur, 
who went on to finally hit it big with the group Cinderella. And so Larry was a friend of mine because he was managing the Steve Morse band. He said, hey, Rod, I got you an audition with Joel and Turner. I said, hey, Larry, thank you very much. So I went to New Jersey. I did the audition. And um, Larry called me a couple of days later and said, Rod, what happened? I said, what do you mean what happened? He said, well, Joe Lynn told me you're the worst drummer he has ever heard. Are you serious? In his life. You talk about gut wrenching. Yeah. I, you know, I guess I had a bad day. I guess I had a very bad wow. day. Really? And he was serious. He was serious. Wow. And, and so, oh man, it was not not much more than a year later. I ran into Joe at a party where I was now in Winger, and I was in Billboard holding my million selling platinum album. <laughs> And he, you know, he came over to me and smiling. He shook my hand. He said, touche, Rod, you know, congrats. Right, right. You are a good drummer. <laughs> <laughs>